Gracious Lord, we thank you that surrounded by both the glory of this building that is meant to reflect the joy of this season, we can also, with countless others around the world, make haste to a stable and adore you who loved us so much that you would not abandon us to the powers of death. Thank you. Thank you that we can be here, but most of all, thank you that you are here. And so we do say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening, for the hunger here, O oh God, is great. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. When life gets tough, I read novels. I do that because if there's a lot of emotional taxation going on in your brain, and I'm sure some of the others might agree with you, theological books are no balm. They challenge the mind as opposed to comforting the emotions, and therefore to actually ease off the intellectual rigor and allow the beauty of a well-written book begin to roll over you, for me anyway, is sad. I've been reading this wonderful little book by Wendell Berry called J. Bear Crow. Uh, J. Bear Crow is the town barber in a small little southern town, but not like the barbers I know anyway. This, is, this barber is pretty philosophical. He tells his story, it's all in the first person, but he muses. And one of the things that he said that of course caught my attention was, some of the best things I've ever thought of, I thought of during bad sermons. <laughs> so if your mind begins to wander, know that you have Wendell Berry's permission. So long as the places you go are actually better thoughts than what you normally think. I say all of that because, in essence, this service is in fact meant, meant to invite us into a place of rest. Because you see, the declaration in tableau that is so beautifully laid out in front of us is meant to declare that something has been accomplished. Not something yet to be but something that is yet accomplished. We are not in the darkness of Advent any longer, praying, even longing for the coming of a Savior. But instead, liturgically, the corner has been turned. God of God, light of light, eternal is now here. Oh, come, let us adore him. And I have to tell you, because for me, at least at a personal level anyway, Advent's been pretty difficult. There's a part of me, in fact, did you notice when we were singing Noel, Noel, I came around and I stood and I started looking at the crush figures. Part of me didn't want to leave. I wanted to just stop and ponder what it is that I was beholding. I have to tell you, I've even had this vision. I mean, I don't know, this is not thunder and lightning vision, more like musing, where I go and I go to the real stable and I walk up to where the manger is and where the baby is in the manger. And I want to just sit down and I want to take the infant's hand and just sit there. If you've ever held a peaceful baby, you know what calming it can bring to the soul. It's like solace is just communicated to you through that baby's flesh. It's quite a remarkable experience. It, as a new father, it was certainly not something I was prepared for, that when they actually handed that baby to me and I put that baby right there, it was as if 
something just happened. And to hold the hand of the infant Jesus, and to know, as the poet said, heaven in little space abides there. And to know that in the simplest of acts, to just take the hand, to know that in some way it's a reminder that if I am in fact who I say I am as a Christian, just as surely in my, as in my mind's eye, I'm holding the hand of that baby, even more surely than that, there is a union in my soul between my own humanity at its worst and at its best in and connected to God. And that is a decision that God made first, long before I ever could, to call me as his own and to take me and to literally unite me spirit to spirit with the Godhead. That is more unfathomable than anything I can even begin to imagine. But it, even that is dwarfed by the fact that somehow I'm invited to come to the humility of a stable and there ponder glory to God in the highest. It, it, is, it just literally shakes my logic on the inside to be invited to do such a thing. That angels, yes, glory, yes, stable, maybe if you're a horseman, but no, it's not the place where I would go to see veiled in flesh the Godhead see but it is that which God has invited you and me to go. Because you see, there's a challenge in this tableau. Not only does it say in a way that brings extraordinary comfort that <laughs> in the hand of an infant, I'm grasping eternity. But just as Jesus, as it says in Philippians, laid aside all that was rightfully his and taking on the form of a slave to come in this body of an infant. So too, if I am to take the hand of that infant, am invited to, in fact, say no to the things that I would want and find new solace in a path that I would not have chosen for myself. And yet, that is, the, the, in fact, the path that leads to eternal life. The humility of the stable is that Jesus comes, God in the flesh, to invite us to follow him in the most unlikely places. I actually, in taking the hand, say yes to a life no longer on my own terms. That the humility of God that we see in the stable is in fact meant to be incorporated into us so that what is true now in us is a kind of profound humility that because I was allowed, I was allowed to take the hand of that infant through no qualification of my own, I'm invited to keep that hand in my hand and be taken, guided, sometimes driven, sometimes even against my will, taken to places that I would not normally even want to go, to experience both glory and grief that I never ever would have expected, life no longer on my terms. And so long as I can take that hand, or better yet, so long as I can know that that hand is grasping mine and chooses not to let me go, what does the scripture say? I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can take you out of my hand. So long as I know that he has gripped me in such a way and I continue to be taken, even though it feels often blind, even though it makes no sense from time to time, it certainly defies logic. The path is circuitous, is it not? There is not a straight line between baptism and heaven, at least not in human experience. 
just the opposite. It winds this way, it goes that way, it goes up this way, it goes down that way in a place that often feels like, what does the psalmist say? The valley of the shadow of death. And even when I think somehow I've gotten a grasp of what it means to, in fact, be a follower of Jesus, a turn happens, but it's not just a physical turn. It's an emotional, mental turn that takes me in places that I just don't expect. Is this what you're asking, God? Is this what it is that you want me to become? There's both an adventure and also a kind of terror to it. It is not fun to live in a place of being out of control. And there are plenty of people who call themselves believers in Jesus and yet want with everything inside of them to live a life fully in control. And then they wonder, they wonder why they're stressed out and exhausted all the time. To, to live a life where I am in fact in control and do my, does my best to stay in control is actually to set me at odds with the work of God inside of my soul. Because you see, the work in, of God inside of my soul is an invitation to stable, stable-like humility, where I'm in fact being led. And so, if God is trying to work in you and me that place where we are being willingly led, and sometimes in the very unlikely places, and yet what we're looking for is predictability, for reliability, the capacity to anticipate, to live somehow into the future, it, it, it doesn't work. Why do you think it is? And this is as much for Christians as anyone that we need a kind of break from the stress level that such interior conflict creates. E even some of our religious practices can in fact merely serve as self-medication. A little bit of meditation, a little bit of prayer, and I'm back out the door again. A little bit of Bible to say I've actually done it. A little bit of church service where I show up and I can walk through the liturgy okay, and hope somehow that God gets past my defenses. All of it can become a form of self-medication that enables us, you see, to relax just long enough not to question why it is that we are so insanely frazzled in the first place. In fact, I think that's the way some people deal with television. It's a kind of drug that allows us to relax, put the mind in neutral, but not relax enough to reflect on the most important assumptions that actually drive our lives. Because we don't want that. We want just enough to keep going, to continue just to keep going. And so to come here, to come to the stable, asks of us unpredictability. It asks us to just stop and allow the scene to wash over us. And if we're willing to stay long enough, as opposed to, like, have you ever been to the Louvre in Paris where 50 people are in front of the picture, they walk in and they get close enough to hold up their iPhone, click, click, and they're out the door? And then they can say, I've seen the Mona Lisa? No. They haven't seen the Mona Lisa. That can be what it's like to come here, where you look, you sing, but you don't let it come down into your soul because of what that might ask of you. Challenge and ask some pretty basic questions about how the order of your life is. But you see, if Advent gets dark enough, if the questions become too big, if the tragedies and the difficulties, the unanticipated angst of life gets large enough, it will stop you. <laughs> and that's the grace of God. So that you can, in fact, ask deeper questions. So you can begin to let the beauty the beauty of who God is 
and what it is that God has in fact done for us and wishes to work in us. Let that seep into your soul because that's what Christmas is in fact meant to do, to seep into your soul to begin to bring a new kind of calm into your life. And as a result, a new sense of peace. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. That's what Jesus has to offer to us. I don't always believe that about God. In my mind's eye, when I walk up and sit down and want to hold the hand of the baby, I don't necessarily want to look in his eyes. I'm afraid of what it is that he might see because you still, there's, still, there's still something in me that doesn't entirely believe in the depths of my heart that if I look at Jesus' full face, what I will experience is comfort and joy. And like Peter, when all of the miraculous fish began to show up, he said, oh, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. That echoes within me even more deeply than the invitation to comfort, which means I actually needed to stay longer so that the voice of condemnation can be put aside so that there can be more room, more room for the Savior. Family of God, as we continue to move forward into this service, I would ask that your pace inside slow down and that you find new ways to say yes to the Savior so that, in fact, when you hear the glory to God in the highest, part of you perks up because you too have been invited to humility, to glory, and in the end, to joy. Amen.